Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. What an amazing turnout for this event. We are so excited. Yay! <clears throat> we are thrilled and honored to welcome Abdi Noor Ifton, author of Call Me American, to the Beaverton City Library as part of our second annual One Book, One Beaverton community-wide read. We would like to thank the following. The new friends of the Beaverton City Library for their generous support of this program. Yay. <laughs> the nonprofit The Immigrant Story for the loan of their art exhibit, We the People. And we're very um, glad to have Mayor Denny Doyle here tonight in attendance. And to all library and city staff who have helped make One Book, One Beaverton happen, we heartily thank you. <laughs> and I wanna say a special word of thanks to my coworker, Jenny Chamberlain, whose hard work, creative spirit, and commitment to excellence are so integral to the success of this program. Thank you, Jenny. Okay, a few housekeeping things before we get started. Please silence your cell phones if you haven't done so already. Um, and we would love to get your feedback about one book, so please fill out a survey on your way out, and, or you could also fill out one online on the library's website. Mr. Ifton will be happy to answer your questions um, at the end of his talk. We will have a wireless microphone that we'll be passing along the aisles to those asking questions. And finally, we would like to invite you to join us upstairs after the program for light refreshments and an opportunity to get your book signed. In Call Me American, Abdi Noor Ifton recounts his harrowing story of growing up in Civil War torn Somalia, his time as a refugee in Kenya, and his eventual journey to live in the United States. We were initially drawn to this memoir because of its timeliness given our national conversation around immigration and refugees. And we soon saw its potential to inspire conversations in our own community. Conversations about why America still beckons to those around the world looking for a better life, about what it means to be American, about the power of the human spirit, and so much more. We also found Abdi's story compelling as a work of autobiography, deeply earnest and personal, inspiring and full of hope. Abdi dreamed for so many years of becoming an American, and his journey here was long and difficult. So we are so happy to say that two weeks ago, he was sworn in as a citizen of the United States. <laughs> And now, please join us in welcoming Abdi Noor Ifton. How's everybody doing tonight? Did I speak so fast? You know, I learned English from movies, so I can do whatever I want with it, right? <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. It is a real pleasure to be here tonight. And it's especially honoring um, to be able to travel this far from the other side of the country. Uh, specifically to present my story, um, a, a story that I think should remind so many of us here in America things that we take in life for granted. We don't fully appreciate 
these days everything we have, including the purpose and principle of human rights, the liberty and dignity, the fundamental freedoms and free, uh, freedom of speech and movement, the freedom to choose where you want to be and who you want to be with. We take everything for granted, including clean water, um, electricity, relative safety, the possibility of finding a job, and the possibility of also finding home, decent home. These are the things that I struggled with growing up as a kid. So again, I'd like to say I'm here today, tonight, as a newcomer, or shall I say a stranger, who has examined and knows what it means to not have everything that I've just mentioned above. And I hope this story in my book, Call Me American, makes you appreciate the things that we have in this country as a nation. Some of you may have read the book, some of you may have not, but for those of you who read, who read the book, um, you may see the distance that someone has to travel to earn the rights that one has. But for those who have not read, let me just give you a quick preview of this story. It's about life growing up in Mogadishu, Somalia, from the civil war, tribal, tribal rivalry, the biggest power shift in, uh, in Mogadishu, Somalia, in 2006, when the warlords that were running everything at the time were kicked out, and a group allied, allied to Al-Qaeda took power. In addition to this, Somalia was also home to some of the worst droughts and famine that killed thousands, including my own sister. And it has also displaced millions, including my own family. Well, I was there breathing and playing like every other kid on earth, when in fact the numbers were scary. And what I mean by that is one in six children, when I was a child, one in six children was dying from hunger and starvation and diseases. Did I have to sit and wait to die? Or did I have to move around, do what I needed to do? And then again, I was there when 1.5 million Somalis were starving to death. I remember the pain and the suffering. Sometimes it's hard to use words to describe what that pain is. But let me give you a sense of what it looks like. Hunger and starvation can both destroy the body's ability to absorb nutrients. And then, you know, imagine being called a, the Civil War child or when I was a teenager, I was the, the war correspondent. These were my titles in Somalia. Let's see, in America today, um, you see your kids being good at something. It could be skating, hockey, what else? Volleyball, basketball, football. And can you think of how lucky they are to come home in the evening to find food in the fridge and clothes in their closet and when they grow up they probably know what they want to be doctor engineer astronaut teacher scientist so many things in this country so many things that never came to my mind And as we gather here tonight, we also need to think about, or maybe I should remind you of those kids, the same age as yours, in Yemen, Syria, Somalia, Libya, Sudan, and you name it. So many countries that have been at war. Every tomorrow might be the last day on earth for them. And for me, growing up in Somalia, there were no access to basic schooling or books to read or 
learn to travel, when all you have is fear, trauma, disappointment, life has no meaning at all. At times, it's, just, it's the strongest that comes out of this, and the world should, should celebrate this survival, not build walls or close doors or kick people out. I get asked many times, um, how much luck has played in your life to get here? How do you do it? How did you figure it out? There's so many questions that come every day as I meet people. Well, it's easy. Thanks to those fabulous action movies <laughs> that popped up in my neighborhood as a kid that allowed me to learn enough English to dispatch stories to the world to help understand not only the miseries of wars and poverty and hunger, but hope, resilience, and perseverance. I really wanted the world to see us this way. To know things in Somalia, the basic, um, the everyday life, families like mine, not what you see on Black Hawk Down or Captain Phillips, that in fact might mischaracterize what my country looks like. There are tons of survival stories in Somalia. People leave, smile, play. Kids in Somalia or anywhere else in the world today want to live in a decent life. They want to live in a world that, that offers opportunities, education, safety, and dreams. And guess what? You don't have to be born in this country to become an American. Mine had started as a child, and my friends started nicknaming me American when I memorized and repeated everything that another American immigrant by the name Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> I said how he said it. I was skinny, rough, but I, by heart, I thought I was him. And through him, I saw the idea of America. Well, I, as you just heard, that nickname that I earned at age nine because of my passion and obsession with movies, two weeks ago has officially become my nationality. Thank you. Yeah, I took my oath of allegiance on January 17th in a beautifully organized naturalization ceremony that had been in Portland, Maine. The other Portland. <laughs> but um, that's a happy ending. Um, but let me just bounce back a little bit. And you probably are wondering if you haven't read the book or listened to this American Life story uh, piece about me. I would love to uh, read you a short piece that a friend of mine, an American journalist, his name is Paul Solopek, he's a twice Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, his name is Paul, as I said earlier. He wrote an article for the Atlantic uh, Journal in May 2009 after he and I briefly met. It was just, I could say, the right time, the right place. I was bare feet and I wandered into him. And this is what he wrote after he met me and he flew back um, and left me behind in the dusty series of Mogadishu when in fact for a week I haven't been able to set eyes on my mother or my sister or my sister's kids. Families were torn apart by the wars. Um, And here it goes. Whenever things get particularly bad in Mogadishu, Somalia, I hear from Abdi. I recognize his emails immediately. They pop into my computer under one or two equally benign subject headings. Hi or hello. <laughs> Clicking open 
this email, I get machine ganned by messages like this one from February 24. Hello, Ball. It's Abdi. The war is still happening in the capital. I don't know who's fighting, but I can tell you the war is bitter and nasty. Paul goes on to say in the article, Abdi, whose full name I obliged to withhold for his own safety, is not a professional journalist. Abdi is an intense, wispy young man who dresses against all bitter judgment, like a robber in a Bernal war zone. I met him two years ago in Mogadishu, the shell-blasted corpse of a city without being kidnapped by insurgents or a clan mafia. Abdi appeared in my safe house, uninvited. <laughs> Startling my rent a guards, who supposed that my presence was a secret. But here's this guy showing up. Abdi wanted to complain about the, the indignities of survival in a country that hasn't had any functional government since 1991. Virtually his entire young life. He proceeded to do so in a slangy English, learned from Hollywood action films. So Paul would go on to say that he would not hear from me in a while, and then he assumed that I did not make it. There were weeks, in fact, that he thought I died, until again he hears back from me. This was, this was a pretty bad time when I met Paul in those years because the civilian death was daily, and Paul would always write to me, either at the beginning of his email or at the end of his email, to say, stay safe. And nobody ever said those words to me. Never. I'm used to a community that's all scared and going through the trauma, but to hear those two words from him meant everything change my life. So, as a young man, I had choices, either to join an armed group or fight their rival, meaning you have to join either. So, not many young men wanted to do, so, to do that either. Some escaped, risked their lives, going on crowded boats uh, headed to Asia, some went on a difficult and deadly journey across the African uh, uh, Sahara Desert and into Europe, but money went into nearby countries like Kenya and became refugees. And I was one of a half million Somali refugees who made it to Kenya. For the first time ever, my name had appeared officially on an internationally recognized refugee paper. This is issued at the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. But to get that, I had to, seek, I, I had to seek asylum, and it took about eight months. Well, when I got that paper, I mean, imagine, I grew up with no passport, no birth certificate, nothing with me when I came to Kenya. It's just me. But now that I, have a, I had a piece of paper that said the following words, Please extend to this person recognition of all rights and obligations contained in the Refugee Act of 2006, the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees, and the 1969, the Organization of African Union Convention on Specific Aspects on Refugee Problems in Africa. Sounds sweet, right? <laughs> None of those rights existed at all for any Somali refugee. That piece of paper that I kept in my pocket day and night served nothing. Gangs controlled parts of my neighborhood. The police was corrupt and sent refugees to prison without crimes. I had been handcuffed many, many, many times. What did I do? I was just there. That was a crime. So I had to wait 30 years of my life before I finally found a little bit of luck in my life. 
I applied to the immigra immigration visa lottery through the U.S. visa lottery program. This program was set up in 1990 by an act of Congress and aims to diversify, aim is to diversify <laughs> the U.S. immigrant population. How sweet, huh? <laughs> so with this, with this program, you do not need family ties here in the U.S. to qualify. Well, I recommend that you go listen to Abdi and the Golden Ticket on This American Life. We covered all of the journey after I won the lottery to the moment that I've arrived here. It would just take us forever to explain everything. But there were incredible challenges that I faced even though I won the lottery. Nothing is easy. Nothing's easy. You know how, how they make it look like everything's simple? I hate to say this, but the other day, less than a week ago, I, I was, someone sent me a clip of President Trump talking about the lottery program, and the way he described it was like, you put your arm in a bottle and pick up a number. That's how he thinks it works. <laughs> no. No. Not really. It's not like that. It's not like that. Um, so, uh, well, the thing here is my, my journey, my long, rough journey, is not a self advancement, but a quest. A quest to break free from ethnic starvation and, ha and hatred. I hope this becomes a story of inspiration for anyone who reads it. Because you know in America today, immigration is a huge issue. And you may know that, again, the president that we have today is working on abolishing the immigration visa lottery program that allowed me to come here. He's working on that as we speak. But most importantly, I see my story as part of the broader American immigration story. Millions have migrated here before me, and millions will come here in the future. So we need to hear the stories of those coming, those on their way, just the same way that we have heard the stories of those who came here in the past. Some of them, believe it or not, have founded this nation. But what does that mean now, being a citizen, I'm here, is that the end of the journey? No, it's not. I felt like the moment I landed in Maine, the road widened. There's so many things to do. And storytelling from immigrants and refugees is very important. It's very important to remind us specifically who we are. Um, I don't know if anybody else feels this, but I get frustrated to be called all these things. Immigrant, refugee, asylee. When will that ever end? Or is this gonna stick with us for the rest of our lives? You know, we need, we need to get out to the world, we need to participate, and most importantly, we need to be as equal as anybody else. I will tell you one thing, um, and I know you probably have questions based on like how, the, I, how did the idea of writing this memoir came together. There was uh, less than a year when I moved into the US, and I was still basically learning how things work, like how the microwave works. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and why in the world do the people in New England have basements? There were so many things I was worried <laughs> and wondering. And then I was very lucky to be invited to a very high level summit organized by the United Nations um, um, in, in New York. Uh, that's, that's the headquarters. This was the summer of 2015. We still had President Obama. He and I happened to be in the same building. <laughs> but I, I I couldn't stop but think about entering that building. For those of you who know the United Nations headquarters in New York, entering that building was like crossing into a, into a country. I was interviewed at the door the same way that I was interviewed at the embassy in Kenya. And then thorough screening and then taking pictures and then fingerprints and, and then I realized I didn't have a tie so they almost sent me back. Random person definitely gave me one. 
Um, but this is a building that represents the world. It's not an American building. It's a United Nations building. And um, the subject, the, the, the discussion that, that day was uh, a large movement of refugees and immigrants. And the goal of the summit was to create a more res responsible, predictable system for responding to the large movement of refugees and asylum seekers and immigrants. And at the end of the summit, members came together and they adopted what they called a global compact on responsibility sharing. You know what I mean by that was commitments for refugees and migrants, or sometimes as they call it, the New Deal. Well, guess what? It ended with handshakes, some delicious chicken sandwich, <laughs> and salad, and people including, um, you know, well, people wandered around. If you, if you have ever been in that building, there's a lot of beautiful things to see, portraits of famous people, presidents, and heroes like Nelson Mandela. But the faces of real immigrants were missing. My mother was not there. My sister was not there. My other sister who died doesn't exist anymore. She's gone. And all these things were ringing in my head. And how about those in Syria, Yemen, Libya? You know, these wars, the conflicts that were just beginning at the time. What's going to happen? So by that year, 63 million people were displaced and were refugees. Today, 2020, it's over 70 million. So we're not doing any good job. Just those handshakes haven't resulted in anything. And I felt at that moment while I was standing there, the true stories were not told. The real people were not invited. I was not even in a panel. I was sitting there listening to other people who have never been refugees in their whole life discuss and debate about refugees and figuring out how to help us and what we need to do and how to stop migration, how to deal with other governments, host nations, what do they need to do with, with immigrants, on and on and on and on and on. I could not help but start thinking constantly and my mind was at work. So I went back to that lux luxury hotel that they put me on that night. Even though I couldn't figure out how the shower works, All I knew is that I could just lay in there and think, and I put together the first thousand words of my book. What was, what, what was in the book? The first, um, uh, first hand experience of the root causes of displacement, becoming a refugee, the despair and the hopelessness that breeds the love and the hope for life, the never ending dreams, the daily fight for the basic human desire, survival, the fight for the for fundamental freedoms, the little motivation, including movies and music that take a place, that take the place of school, the risk-taking opportunities of becoming a war correspondent and escaping terror and recruitment. But I was most disturbed by the use of numbers in meetings like that one. They use numbers and statistics to describe immigrants, refugees. What do they say? Millions have been displaced. Millions have been here and there. You know, it's, it's all about numbers. Displacement and refugees are more than numbers. They're stories. And how about the empty promises and the empty words that make no sense at all that sometimes come from leaders and they end, up, they end up nowhere. Many times before I wrote my memoir, my photos were taken, my stories were edited and crammed into just one page to talk about who I was. Details of my life were missing. I couldn't even understand. It's my story. It's one page, it's more than that. Also many times media and organizations can use your story in any way that they want. They'll bring their own words, you become the third person. So they talk about you. They would say, he did this, he did that. They're narrating your story. But also, why can't I be seen as a human being who can speak for himself? Not as a helpless immigrant, starved child 
who you need to use your good English to advocate for me. You know, it's hard for the world to see, to see you when you're a refugee. You're invisible, and that's what I felt ever since. And finally, after I have been through all of this, arriving in the world's best, I would say, greatest country, it's still sad today that our own leaders not only ignore us, but they just don't want to reaffirm the values of dignity and equality of every human being. What do we have now? Xenophobia, uh, xenophobia racial, ethnic, or tribal discrimination, and intoler intolerance and stereotyping are pre uh, prevalent. It's, it's everywhere. It would be fair, I think, if at least once in your life, if you became a refugee, if you have been displaced, you would just feel the pain. It's excruciating. But while that happens, while people move on and ignore what just they talked about, who refugees are, and while people run their own lives, on the other hand, we need to know that refugees out there in a the camp in Greece, in the Dab, Kakuma, Turkey, Qatar, wherever there, there is out there that refugees are, Palestine, they can only see freedom through the flopping canvas of a tent. Or when they when they carry their children and possessions on their backs, walking hundreds, hundreds of miles, perhaps even thousands sometimes, so far away from home, and going into the uncertainty of the future. You know, when you and your family, for instance, and friends risk drowning or are kept in cramped and appalling detention centers, or even once released, risk abuse by racist and xenophobia, the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, that the world failed in helping the world's moving population. The world failed millions of immigrants who deserve far more than lives marked by cradle to grave dignity and desperation. What does not exist is respect, safety, and dignity for all. So I hope that as you go home tonight, um, that you really think about it. Just make a friend, someone who has really lived in a camp before, who's been a refugee before, who's been an immigrant before, and ask them their stories. Storytelling is a power. And if you're an immigrant, migrated to this country, doesn't matter if, if it's recent or if you came here at the age of 15, you know what's out there. It's an amazing feeling to live through life sometimes, other than the one that you know. I know that Somalia is still at war, 30 years, as, as, nearly as old as I am. But guess what? There are so many things I miss about home. And it's true. I miss smell of food. I miss family, the beautiful warm ocean, the sand, the air. And most importantly, I think there's something about home that I miss. And as an American citizen, I look forward to nothing. Sometimes get confused. People ask me, do you want to go back to Somalia? And the answer is 100% yes. But when? The world has fallen apart. Um, well, I will take questions in a few minutes. I apologize if, I was being, if I've been speaking too long. You can ask questions of any kind, okay. Um, some of the questions that most people ask me were related to combating xenophobia or fighting racism, what are the best ways to do that. I'm still figuring myself out uh, because I didn't create them. So I can't find a solution for them. Um, or how to, how to help immigrants wherever they are. Um, so let's open the questions. All right, someone has a mic somewhere. Sorry. It was crazy. <laughs> 